Why work? Why not just be a lazy bum on a park bench somewhere? What does God say about work in these days, especially in an age of high unemployment? What does God's word say? Well, one of the chapters of the Bible that deals with work extensively is Exodus chapter 16. And in our series going through the book of Exodus, we come to chapter 16 and verse 1, and it says this. It says the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. And so Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it is the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening, and all the bread you want in the morning. Because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked towards the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread of the Lord. The bread the Lord has given you to eat, and this is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much and some little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much. And he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it till morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning everyone gathered as much as he needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. 
On the sixth day they gather twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. And so they saved it until morning, as Moses commanded. And it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. And you will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went on out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath, and that is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. And so the people rested on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made like honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to be kept for generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna in front of the testimony, that it might be kept. The Israelites ate manna forty years until they came to the land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. An omer is one-tenth of an ephah. Just so far in God's word as we look at this passage together today. You see, the Bible tells us that God led his people from the happy holiday they had at Elam back to the hard work of crossing the desert called sin. And many of us have come back from holidays, from Christmas break, from the public holidays over New Year. And now we come into a new year, a year to work. And our challenge in this passage is to learn from what God taught the Israelites. All of us love our times of rest, our holidays. But the reality is that you and I grow best when we are under the pressures of of normal working life day to day. You see, when we're at the hot coal face, we may find the materials for that industrial diamond that we need. And so we grow as a Christian as we learn the lessons of work. And we need to remember these early lessons that we learn from work. I remember when I began working, one of the first lessons I learned was a, a tough old taskmaster of a, a boss said to me, you need to work hard so that when you get your paycheck, you don't have to blush because you didn't earn it. Work hard, he said. But here we are reminded that God is the one that has something to say about our work. That work which takes up one third of our day. If we sleep for eight hours and work for eight hours, then God has something to say about that working period in our modern day and age. And the Bible, in a sense, has answers to all of life's questions because God gives us a pattern for human work. For your day, what does God say? And so we need to look at the situation. Here is two and a half million refugees, probably, crossing the Sinai Peninsula, and now they've gone on for around 40 days, and their supplies have probably run out or run low, and they begin to grumble. 
in actual fact, the first point I would call grumblers galore. Grumblers galore. The old saying that the devil finds work for idle hands. Well, the people weren't working. They were just putting one foot in front of another, following the cloud every day. And now they began to grumble. They got into a routine. The daily march, the drudgery had set in. And so the grumbles began and there were grumbles galore. But notice that in the grumbling, firstly, grumbling has a short term memory. Grumblers are very short on their memory. Verse 3 tells us that they remembered back and they thought of the, they forgot the pain of slavery. They forgot the lack of freedom. They forgot the whips of their taskmasters. They forgot all that God had rescued from them. And the past was idealized. It is very unlikely that slaves ate pots of meat every day. Maybe at best they had a meat as a Sunday roast, maybe on Sunday or whatever the case was. But here they were grumblers and grumblers are short on memory because Israel had heard uh, of what God had done and now they had seen it. And more than that, they were short on memory because they had sheep with them and cattle with them that had come out. But the problem was those sheep and cattle were their assets. And yet rather than using their livestock, they expected God to bail them out. The reality is when you and I follow Jesus, when we leave sin behind us, when we're done with the ways of this world, then we forget the emptiness of our old way of life. We forget the hopelessness of being without Christ. We forget the many depressions that came from the emotional turmoil of being disconnected from our Creator. We must stop grumbling and remember what God has done. But grumblers also are short-sighted. Verses 7 and 8 tell us that while the people grumbled against Moses, it was ultimately against God that they were grumbling. Grumbling cuts through the lace curtain of what we see around us and grumbles against God. It wounds God who is hidden by our circumstances. And so we grumble about other Christians and hurt God. We grumble about the church that Jesus died for to make his bride. They fail to see God's provision in their life. Grumblers forget God's presence with us always. And so grumblers are short of memory. Grumblers are short-sighted, but also grumblers are short on faith. Grumblers think that God will let them down. And God often delays his help until we come to the end of ourselves and we learn to pray. But he who did not spare his only son on the cross for our sin, will he not give us all things as he has promised? You see, God does care for you. He has counted all the hairs on your head and you are more precious than all the mosses in the trees around your house. You see, grumbling does the work of the devil. Grumbling accuses God's people. Grumbling demotivates people around you. And the cure for grumbling lies in trusting God. Grumbling fails to trust him and have faith in Jesus. You see, the cure lies in accepting the situation he has put you in. And trusting God's wisdom for that situation. That God will care for you. That God loves you. And that he has a purpose in where you're at right now. And so if you're grumbling, learn from the grumblers galore in this passage. Turn from that and see what God says. Because the second thing we learn from this passage is what I've called a gauge of your faith. A gauge of your faith. Verse 4 tells us that obedience to God's instruction for work 
becomes a gauge, a measure of God's work in your life. It becomes a gauge of your faith in God. It measures how much you trust God. God's people were given clear instructions on how to gather manna and quail as a gauge of their faith. So the first thing we need to do when we work in engaging our faith is to focus on God. God needs to come first in all our work and our labor. We must learn to look up to God. The New Testament puts it this way, that we are to do all our work as unto Christ. Not for that boss that's looking over your shoulder or for the paycheck at the end of the month. But do your work as unto Jesus. That's what he teaches us. We must learn that as Israel looked up and saw God's glory in the clouds in verse 10, so they responded with a focus on God. A good question to ask yourself is, when I work, am I doing it focused on God, looking to Him? In other words, you and I must work because God is the one that gives us work. He is the one that created work right from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Long before sin came into the world, he gave work to Adam and Eve and he told them to maintain the garden, to keep it up, to look after all that he had planted for them and all the trees and to prune them and to keep them uh, producing what the fruit that he had designed them to produce. And so work was something God gave from the very beginning, tending the garden. And work was part of God's plan for you and for me as human beings. And that means work is good. Now, when sin came into the wor world, sweat was added to that work. And sweat runs down our forehead and into our eyes and makes our eyes sting and smart. But the reality is work in and of itself is good though now we have the added disadvantage of sweat. But the reality is we are to focus on God. Look, but when you gauge your faith by making God the center of your work, the second thing we need to see is gauge your faith by seeing that food for every day is the result of your work. Jesus taught us to pray, give us today our daily bread. Then he says, go out and work. And from the work he gives you, he will feed you your daily bread. He will give you the strength. He will give you the job. He will give you the contacts, the opportunities that come your way that enable you to work. And so for Israel, they daily saw the connection between their early morning work and the food on their table. The problem is for many of us today, we go to work and we uh, do our work and we get a salary at the end of the month and we forget the connection between that money in our bank account that enables us to pay our bills and buy our groceries is connected directly to each day's work. Each one had to wake up early before the sun melted the harvest of manna on the ground. And in a real sense, they could not rely on yesterday's savings, on that which they had accumulated yesterday and went rotten. And isn't it so true with our savings these days? They disappear in bank crashes and stock market losses. And the reality is we need to work as unto Christ every day and make him the focus. You see, our biggest problem, of course, is that in our modern world, they retire us at 60 or 70 or 65. Whatever the date, the reality is God created us to work. Maybe lighter work as we get older and weaker, but we are to work. So I want to encourage you to work as unto Christ every day. But if you do have to retire, make sure you don't just retire and put your feet up and die soon thereafter. But keep working in some way or another. God has provided these opportunities and serve him with all that you are. But if we are to see that food for each day is a res result of our hard work, 
we need to see thirdly that faithfulness to God's holy day of rest is something that God requires of you and me. That's what it says, that if we're going to gauge our faith, we need to see that part of that faith is resting on one day in seven. That's what verse 22 and verse 23 tell us. Interesting that it's a spiritual fact that God supernaturally takes our work and makes it last for an extra seventh day a week. In other words, he says, work hard for six days and I will give you seven days worth of food. He takes our work and blesses it. He adds to it. And rest then is so important to work. Rest is why God intervenes in time and space and makes our work stretch an extra day. In seven, one day in seven, he blesses you to work. He rested and we are to rest. Now I must tell you that this is an unusual concept. Many people have struggled with this. In actual fact, atheist societies have uh, reacted and rebelled against this twice in history. Once during the French Revolution, they discarded everything the church taught and said, now we will have a 10-day working week. It will be like the metric system, 10 days, not seven days. And they tried to get people to work for nine days and then rest for one day. And guess what they found? Productivity declined so dramatically, they went back to a seven-day week. Well, the communist revolution in Russia tried the same thing. They tried a seven-day week. And wherever people have become workaholics, it's destroyed them, whether their health or something else. God calls us to trust him and to demonstrate our faith by resting. Good question to ask yourself is, are you living by faith? Are you resting one day in seven as a faithful response to what God has told you? A gauge on your faith, a measure on your faith, because God is the one that gives you a pattern for human work in these days. But if there is a gauge for your faith, I want you to see thirdly from this passage, a great feast, a great feast. A great feast is had when we do work God's way, because there are some things that we can't earn. The manna that the people of Israel got was free. God's gracious provision. Our jobs are his provision in our lives. They are gifts from God. We are to pray for God's solution as a church for the unemployment in our age. We are to look for ways to solve that unemployment. That unemployment dehumanizes people. But if we have a job, we are to serve God joyfully in these days. And so that manna in the desert was a meal in one. Verse 31 describes it as white and tasting both sweet and flowery. To feed two and a half million people for 40 years, six days a week. Now that's a miracle. And that's what God did, is that John, the beloved apostle, records Jesus. And he tells us that Jesus likened the manna from heaven with himself. He tells us that as God fed his desert people, so Jesus is God's spiritual food for a world in a desert of sin. Today, we are reminded that daily we need to come to Jesus Christ. Daily we need to receive his forgiveness for our sins. Daily we need to come to Jesus and ask him to not only forgive us, but to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Daily we need to come to God and to give him our work. Daily we need to give him our will. His will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Daily we are to give God our plans and ask the Holy Spirit to supernaturally add his blessing to everything that our work entails. So that our work gives us then rest and peace and joy and the resources to share with others and help others and love others as God has loved us. And so as Psalm 34 and verse 8 tells us, taste and see 
what the, that the Lord is good. Blessed is the person who, ta who takes refuge in God. I need to ask you, have you come to Jesus Christ and taken refuge in Christ? For your hungry soul, have you found manna in Christ? Have you cried out to Jesus for forgiveness and asked him to feed you daily, spiritually, in every way of your life? You see, it is that God that gives you a pattern for human work. And when you're not working for him, you may become critical and cynical. And we need to remember that you can then become a grumbler grumbling against God. And you forget the terribleness of sin. And you sin against God in grumbling. And you fail to trust him. And so you can complain or you can roll up your sleeves and get down to work, which is a gauge of your faith as you focus on Jesus and do everything as unto Christ, as you realize that your work puts his food on your table, and as you are faithful then to rest one day in seven, like God did, and like he commands us to do in the Ten Commandments. And so God calls you to trust him. Because we have then come to Jesus Christ, for a great feast, to be full of hope, full of love, full of his peace and joy and patience and kindness and perseverance through the sweat of work. And so the question really remains, do you really know Jesus Christ, your Savior? And have you put your total trust in Jesus Christ? Choose today, choose at the beginning of this new year, to start feeding on Christ daily. But feed on Christ and choose to do that, praying to him, telling him about all your work plans, laying it out before him and involving Jesus as the center of your work, of your life, of your family and doing everything that and then as unto Christ, not for that grumpy boss, but for Jesus. And doing it to his glory. So before all the intrusions of the day come in, gather your manna. Gather God's word into your heart and hide it there for all the challenges that lie ahead. And then trust God to do your work for six days as you work unto Christ. And then rest. Stay in your home and rest before him. And show that you are a follower of Jesus. By your good work, your hard work, and your faithful rest every week as you rest for God because he is the one that has given you this gift. Trust him. Do you know this? Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this reminder from your work, very, word very practically on how to work. We realize, Lord, that we need to turn to you and we pray that you would meet with us Help us to trust you in these difficult days, to do things your way and to keep being faithful to you. Meet with us, we pray, Lord, and direct our thoughts, we, play, we plead. Make us faithful as we put our faith in you. But for some of us, Lord Jesus, we are conscious that we need to come to you and cry out, Jesus, be the manner of my life. Be the saviour and change my attitude at work. Change me, Lord Jesus, to work as unto Christ and to do everything for Jesus. And so lead us, Lord Jesus, we pray. Direct our thoughts and our minds that we would glorify you. For all this we ask in the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I pray that God has met with you in the service and encouraged you to work for him this year, whether it's in the office or in the factory or within the body of Christ, but serve him faithfully. And then may your life bring him glory and praise and honor both now 
and forevermore. Amen.